well, now you know it's Chris Nowak, not Carol Davis Smith up here. Um, uh, unfortunately, Carol uh, injured her back uh, late last week, and uh, being on an airplane for four or five hours just didn't seem possible. So, uh, so they asked me to uh, jump in, and excellence by design was Carol's topic, and uh, uh, I. I love service excellence. I, I love to drive some service excellence initiatives. And I thought I'd uh, put together some nuggets of information. Hopefully you can walk out of here today uh, with a little nugget. And uh, I have some of uh, my strong peers in the room that hopefully will help me out and add to uh, the opportunity to, to uh, impart some wisdom uh, to everybody in attendance. So uh, Chris Nowak, as John said, Roughly uh, 39 and a half years in the HTM field. They, somebody awarded me uh, the Director of the Year award yesterday. It was fantastic. Uh, uh, very humbled. Some of uh, my uh, oldest uh, friends in the room today, Pat Philbin, I've known. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I had hair in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was previously chairman of the ICC, the BMET Board of Examiners, uh, when the ICC had the uh, certification program. And then uh, after Amy acquired the certification program, uh, I was like the second or third chairman uh, on the uh, ACI, the Amy Credentials Institute Board. Uh, I presented nationally and internationally in healthcare technology management, uh, had the opportunity to speak in uh, Italy. Chile, Japan, and uh, Germany. They were fun presentations. Learned a little bit about uh, the European Union and how they do things and how it compares to how we do things over here. Uh, little known fact, I have some product management and sales experience in my background. I work for what today is MindRay, but it was Datascope back then. I was a product manager for all of their OEM products. So uh, we had Datex gas module, anesthesia anesthetic gas model, Brooker MRI monitor, and Fukuda Denshi for patient monitor. So uh, I got to travel uh, internationally for those products. And then uh, I, I have sold uh, clinical engineering programs in the US as well. Uh, one thing I was talking to Suli Chi before the meeting and uh, uh, just chatting away, said something about my airplane. She goes, oh my gosh, you're a pilot. You should tell people you're a pilot. I said, but uh, I used to get to fly around the Northeast uh, when I was with an Aramark and go to meetings. In fact, uh, one of our friends, Frank Scherer, and I uh, flew from Jersey to Syracuse to Massachusetts. And so it's been a great career in HTM and uh, very successful. So my presentation, Excellence by Design, what is service excellence? Um, Service excellence is the act, act of exceeding service expectations and delivering exceptional service experience for your customer. Who's your customer? Well, everyone's your customer. Um, your, your peer next to you on the bench that's working next to you, um, heck, the janitor in the institution, supply chain, and your vendors uh, are your customers. What do I mean by that? Why, how does that play into a service excellence? Um, it plays into the service excellence model because we really are a community in healthcare. Uh, not one person uh, can deliver everything that's needed. You might go into a, a, a situation, um, maybe it's a, a cath lab that's down or a CT that's down might not have anything to do with the cath lab or the CT. Maybe it's an electrical issue. Maybe you need to engage facility units. Um, or if it's an outsourced uh, service delivery plan, you'll need to, uh, to involve your vendor. So the service excellence and, and communicating properly and involving everybody to make sure that the end result is that the patient, I, I'd like to say the patient's case is not delayed or canceled due to that piece of technology. So we work together, we try to do it uh, as quickly and as much quality as possible into the repair 
pro process. So why is uh, uh, service excellence important? Well, it drives your brand as an HTM department or if you're a third party or uh, ISO. ISO. Uh, it, it drives your brand. What's your brand? Your brand is really who you are. Uh, your customers are going to have a perception uh, of what your service delivery is. And service delivery excellence or service excellence is tremendously helpful in the process. Uh, by delivering excellent service, um, there's going to be those times where you run into a problem and very difficult problem. But if you have a brand of loyalty and, and uh, service excellence, the customer will say, hey, you know what? You know, no problem. Get it done. Get it fixed. As opposed to being a, uh, a, a, a problem for you to handle uh, where you're doing uh, uh, tremendous service recovery and, and sometimes can be costly. Costly from a perspective, um, if you're an in-house program, it's a you know black mark. It could be a high-profile department uh, that could uh, really be detrimental to how your uh, department is perceived in the institution. Um, your team last uh, provides lasting impressions, uh, and they're they're the ones that are most meaningful to the users. Um, a, a negative impression uh, does can do tremendous damage, and it really uh, creates an issue as a leader trying to create that service recovery uh, program. So um, the data shows that nearly 70% of customers stop working with a service provider due to a single bad experience. It's crazy. So that single bad experience is a, a tremendous issue for you as a uh, an entity, a, a service delivery program. Buyers sign up for specific service, but they're going to stay with you, especially, you know, ISOs, they're going to stay with you because of the service. Uh, you know, uh, Pat and I worked together. Uh, we were in an ISO situation, and um, man, we had some programs that were really not doing very well. They're not doing well financially. Uh, we were on the brink of, uh, of losing the account. And it seemed like every time we switched out, either the leadership or some made some changes within the organization, it's amazing how it flipped around. Uh, my first day on the job uh, with Crawfel Healthcare, um, I was a RVP for Crawfel in the central United States. And uh, my first day on the job was at Lurie Children's Hospital. And uh, I walked into Lurie Children's Hospital for a, uh, a meeting. Uh, with all the services from Crothel, uh, all the Lurie leadership is in the room. And I found out we were served a letter for the clinical engineering program to get rid of us. It's like, oh my goodness, my first day on the job. And I wasn't aware of it. So uh, I called Steve Carpenter at the time and said, Steve, how do you want me to, you want me to fix this? Do you want me to make this right? He said, absolutely. We have all the other services in there. We have patient transport, EVS, food and nutrition services. We had all these different services, but we were doing very poorly in clinical engineering. And it was really, there was leadership issues, uh, but that's 70%, the bad experience really can be detrimental to the program. Even though they love the other services, they were gonna get rid of clinical engineering. So I went to work to do service recovery, service excellence. And there were some uh, challenges on our team and made those challenges uh, go away. And uh, uh, gosh, I, I guess it's probably 10 years later or more, uh, Crothel's still in there. Crothel still runs the clinical engineering department in that place. And it was fun, uh, but it's, it's, such a, uh, it's such a damaging thing when you have uh, poor service excellence. And they were ready to get rid of us in there. Are there benefits? You bet there's benefits. It builds the brand. It's going to develop that trust between you and the customer where they can count on you and your team to do the right thing. Um, and the perception, I love perception is everything. Um, and uh, building the trust of your customers through your service excellence culture um, 
as I said yesterday when I received the award, uh, without my team, I'm nothing. You know, if leaders in the room, are there leaders today in the room? Yeah, without without your team, because uh, I can't be everywhere, every place, uh, and uh, you have to depend on your team. And uh, it matters who you hire. You'll see in a, a couple of slides going forward, uh, who we hire is a big uh, is a big factor on how well we develop that culture of service excellence. And then once you get to that point where your customers trust you, they're going to sell the program for you. So if you're an in-house program, an ISO, uh, it really makes your life easier. And it doesn't take a lot of effort. It costs, very, costs nothing, really. It costs nothing but your time. It costs nothing but your time to drive service excellence, uh, to make sure that your, your team understands the mission. Mike, uh, I just came out of a program that Mike presented next door about strategic planning. Service excellence should be a part of your strategic plan. Because um, it, really, uh, it, it really drives the, uh, the purpose of the business and uh, what we're trying to accomplish. It matches up with the mission statements for your hospitals. So uh, make sure that you have a, uh, you develop a good service excellent culture within the team. Make sure they understand uh, what's expected of them. Document uh, the service excellence program. Make sure they understand exactly uh, what's expected during the, uh, you know, I, I had a, a director that always used to tell me, you know, fixing the device is one thing. And there's a lot of our team members, uh, technical folks that uh, go upstairs, they ga gather the device, they bring it down, they do a phenomenal job troubleshooting it, fixing it. They take it back upstairs and they quietly put it back in the corner of the department and don't communicate with anybody. So some folks understand that, hey, you know what? I did send that thing down. Did, is it fixed? What's, what's, you know, why is it sitting in the corner now? I don't even know if it's fixed. It's that, that second part. You can be Albert Einstein when you uh, troubleshoot and repair a device, but if you don't communicate, you don't take it to the next level and uh, make sure that the department understands, hey, the machine is fully functional. I repaired it. It's safe to use for your patients. That's part of the repair process. If that's not completed, the repair is not done. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's funny. I'll sit here in the front row uh, with Al works for a CMMS uh, company. A CMMS can really help out in this uh, particular situation. So not only does your team document the repairs, the, the whole process of the repair, but the CMMS, hopefully you have a good CMMS that has the opportunity where you can send an, e uh, an email to the person that put the ticket in to make the repair happen. Uh, that way that person uh, gets to see that the repair is completed and then go one step further in the CMMS where maybe it's, they'll send a survey. Some of the CMMS products, can, you can have a prepared survey and it goes to that same person, uh, hey, can you tell us how we did on the repair? And that's really gonna give you some great feedback. I was in Manny Roman's class yesterday about body language. And uh, it was a great presentation, by the way. If you ever get a chance to see Manny Roman present, he is a good presenter. Uh, he has some great topics. And uh, yesterday's was on body language. And uh, I, I think you were in there as well, Albert. Hey, it's it he wants feedback right when you're when you're uh, presenting or talking you know you want to get some feedback from folks and let them know how you're doing and uh, it's the same thing with service excellence right you got to continue to test otherwise how do you build the excellence part of it yeah and you know what mike you know what some of us have uh, leaders have issues with we just assume that that's happening right and that's why i said Really, when you're building your service excellent culture and your service excellence program, write it down. Write it down for your team. Just those questions that Mike was asking. Uh, you know, it's not hard, and they, they don't have to ask every question uh, that you put together in the program, in this document that you can put together for, for the service excellence program, but give them some guidance instead of, 
uh, you know, walking up there and looking at their shoes and walking through the department and uh, not, I asked my team uh, from time to time, you know, what did, what did the nurse say? Or what, who, who's the director up there? And who's the PGM over there? And sometimes they don't even know who those folks are because they're just going up there. They have the broken equipment section. You know, maybe the, uh, the, uh, the person that's uh, the unit clerk, unit clerk, you know, there's a desk in front of the unit clerk and that's where all the staff know to put the broken equipment. Or in our case, there's a dirty utility room and they put all the broken equipment and we just go there, right? We don't talk to anybody. And uh, that's, that's the danger. So, you know, the department head or the nurse manager, the shift manager, doesn't even understand that we were even on the floor at that time. So uh, the service excellence culture is what's going to drive the success of the program. And I know at it, it, it Children's, at Arkansas Children's, that person can vary by department. It's not always the PGM in, in our case. Sometimes it's the nurse educator. Some of those nurse educators in our world have uh, a, you know, people look up to them. They have great uh, presence in that department. And they're the ones that are, are great uh, folks to tell uh, what you're up to and what you're doing. And, and, and it goes both ways too, especially with those nurse educators. Uh, you know, one of the other uh, sessions I was in about the clinical aspect of our job and understanding, I, I like to always tell my team, you know, you have the ability to uh, talk the talk as well as walk the walk, right? Uh, you know, a, a nurse or a doctor, uh, it's good to discuss with them uh, and understand what the device is, is trying to do, what the procedure was that they were using it on. It really helps you through the troubleshooting process and get to the problem faster. Um, so service excellence, it really drives a tremendous amount of work what we do uh, in equipment uh, management. Any other questions? Something as simple as treating the uh, customer with kindness, empathy, and respect, and or sending the email. That's why I said the CMMS product, you know, make sure you have a good CMMS product so that it can do some of the work for you. And it can document that, and you can measure that. You can put reports together for your senior leadership about your rounding experience and what you're seeing out there. Uh, the other benefit uh, to having a uh, a service excellence culture is it builds the team morale. Uh, happy customers make happy HTM members, empowering them to be friendly, positive, patient, proud, and solutions oriented. I think this is important. You know, I don't have a book in my, on my bookshelf that says answers. I don't have all the answers. And I want my team to be solutions oriented. So again, the service excellence culture that you build helps I think the team feel empowered to develop um, uh, solutions and come to you with solutions. Uh, I think one of the other, maybe the next slide, it, it talks about breaking down the barriers, uh, removing the barriers. Uh, and that's what uh, service ex your service excellence culture should do. It should empower those folks to be able to develop solutions for your customers and not necessarily have to come to you for answers all the time. Uh, I, 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 uh, you know, sometimes folks come into my office and I'm, I look at them and I say, so what do you think you should do? And uh, sometimes it's the culture that they've come from. Uh, so your, your, your team may have come from a culture where there was no service excellence, there was no empowerment. And, uh, they had leadership tell them what to do all the time instead of develop them, developing them into a rounded individual. They know what to do. Most of them know what to do. They, uh, as I say to my team, do the right thing. If you do the right thing, you're, you're gonna come out on top. If we make a mistake, I'm sure we, we support them. We all recover. Uh, Mike, was it your, presentation, the other presentation yesterday, I forget, uh, talked about team. There's no I in team. And uh, uh, if one of us fails, then the team's going to fail. Because when they're up on the floor and those folks that are having the bad experience that I spoke about earlier in the slide deck, 
you know, they go and they tell the next nursing manager down the road. And so it really hurts the team. It, they don't typically say, you know, well, Johnny or Barbara is the problem. They say clinical engineering or HTM. Man, they really did me wrong. So the team becomes affected. So it's important that we uh, operate as a team and that service excellence culture, everybody understands their role on the team. Yeah. Oh, no. It's Linda, right? Is it? Lynn. Um, it's a, you, you make a great point. You know, one of the things that uh, I like to tell my team, you, you know, look, we're, we're going to have OEM support or third party support, ISO support. So we're going to have folks from the outside come into our organization. We all have to coexist. But you're absolutely right. There is an, a danger to that where uh, they get to be in front of your customer and say, see, you know, this is the result. If you don't use us, uh, you know, your folks aren't exposed enough, they're not trained enough. Um, and it's incumbent upon us as leaders really to develop our team, to get to that point. Um, I always tell my team, uh, you, you know, you put your pants on the same way they do. They, there's nothing special about them. And, you know, I think even today more than ever, that's true because the OEMs are struggling much more than we are sometimes as an in-house. And I, I'm coming from an in-house perspective, so I don't know if we have any ISOs in here or OEMs in here, but I, I'm coming from a, an in-house perspective. And boy, I, I, I had uh, somebody the other day on our team uh, working with the manufacturer's rep, and he was telling that person how to fix the machine. We had a service contract on it, but they had uh, experience from, I had hired him from another uh, organization. He had experience on that. And he's telling the service engineer where to go. So I think it was uh, in dialysis on one of those, uh, that dialysis machine. So uh, Lynn, I hear exactly what you're saying. How do you combat that? Number one, you try to uh, limit the amount of outside service that you're going to need, develop your staff probably run into another problem is financial, right? Can you get your administration to fund the education necessary uh, to get the training and education? Uh, you know, Pat and I worked together there. Uh, and I would, even though I had master service agreements, Lynn, I had uh, service contracts with some of these organizations. When we were in the, in the negotiation process, I told them, hey, look, we're sitting down here and servicing, negotiating this service agreement. However, when I get the call, when my team gets the call that the CT is down or the cath lab is down or the lab analyzer is down, even though I have this full service contract, my team's going up there and they're going to try and do anything they can to make sure they can get that system up and running if they're capable. And I would expect your team to either coach them through. I don't want to have a down system for any length of time that delays my results or my therapy to my patient because of a, we used to have the $3,000 fuse hanging on the wall, yeah, because of a stupid problem that our in-house team. So that's, that's to your point about suppliers. At that point, we're, we're partners in this, but there are vendors that are vendors. Uh, Intuitive Surgical, great example. Uh, Abiomed, another great example. So remember, we're in a we're in a, a safe environment. Yes, we are. So, uh, but yeah, there's some of the great examples of vendors. They they don't care about you. They don't. It's purely transactional. It's all about revenue for them, not about the end result to the patient on the table. So, so yeah, I I tell those vendors, look, we're going up. We're gonna we're gonna try and troubleshoot. I, heck, I've been under the OR table myself on my hands and knees trying to figure out something while Dr. Brockman's up there doing surgery on uh, a heart. So uh, um, I don't know if I answered your question, uh, but, and Lynn, you know, most of the time your in-house team can help that director who wants the best for their patient much faster than having to wait four hours, eight hours for service to appear on site. And you know, there's a good portion of those repairs that are not hard down. Huh? You know, 
we have hard down. I mean, I, I've had the OEM in on a CT scanner. It was down for a whole week. And the volume of parts that they threw at it, it, it it's getting, it seems to be getting worse. I don't know. Anybody experienced the same thing? You know, Steris on Sterilizer. You know, sometimes I can't even get a part uh, out of them on some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But but I, I do want to go back to uh, the other part about building that in-house team and your administration. Um, and I, you, you were third party, right? You're, are you third party or you're in-house? Um, it, it's put together a pro forma. Uh, show them the result. Hey, you know what? If I invest... Twenty thousand dollars into somebody on our team, I can drop this contract, reduce this contract. Uh, I, I tell the story about uh, Accuray on the uh, uh, radiation oncology uh, device. We were paying four hundred ninety-five thousand dollars a year on that robot uh, uh, for uh, radiation therapy, and uh, man, I started talking to that vendor and. Um, Negotiating with it, they sent two of my guys to their class, and they reduced my service contract to two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. It was a win-win. And my, because as you know, radiation oncology, they're scheduled, right? They got patients scheduled back to back to back to back. So any kind of downtime is a tremendous impact to cancer treatment. So that was a that was a great win. Um, so maybe you don't bite the whole apple, but you get a good part of the apple, and you. Provide that uh, in the last in Mike's meeting talked about supply chain. The fellow brought up the supply chain. You know how can I? You make them win. Make them feel as though they were part of that cost savings uh, opportunity. And that's what I did at, at Arkansas Children's with this cerebral oximetry. Two hundred thirty-eight thousand dollars in savings. Here, Ben, that's that's your report. That up at, at UHS Seaman. So. We rolled the program over to an in-house program. It was outsourced to GE previously. Uh, we had a big GE master service agreement. There was a Siemens master service agreement, and uh, uh, some of those were expiring. So we uh, we rolled in a, a, a hybrid system where we were doing some in-house and still had uh, a master service agreement. But the GE contract, um, we, we bid out GE. Uh, Philips was another provider. Uh, and I think there was one other uh, person in the RFP process, and I spelled out exactly what I intended. I intended to build a radiology program, and I wanted them to help me build it. So I wanted cash money for education that we could use, and um, and we're still getting. It. I mean that that successful vendor uh, provided that Siemens that contract expired the next year. And I had negotiated with them, those two men, for uh, over a year. And they did not believe me. They thought, you're not going anywhere. You're going to just roll that into a Siemens contract. We canceled it. We canceled that contract, did some by TNM, rolled it into the other master agreement on the multi vendor side, and we were successful in doing that. So I had a. I had that same vendor, Siemens, down in Texoma Medical Center. We had bought a new interventional lab. Dr. Tank had to have it. This is the one I want. Got to have it. And it was nothing but problems for that first year. It had a lot of issues. And uh, Siemens, we finally, I flew down there. We got everybody at the table, Siemens. I had the CEO and the COO of the hospital in the meeting. I had the cath lab folks in the meeting. and. Um, my director, Ryan, down there, uh, was a fantastic document. He had a CMMS product, uh, Phoenix Data Systems, Ames product. Uh, we documented everything, even if the, even if it was a, a software problem or a, a user had an issue. We had such a relationship with that team; they communicated to Ryan and his staff, so it all went into a CMMS system. Even though our CMMS team wasn't involved, it was all handled by the folks in the cath lab or the interventional lab. 
So we had 37, 38 problems and Siemens came in and said, no, look, it, it, it's only been broken seven times. And we produced, all they wanted us to do, sign the, con it's going out of warranty. Just sign the contract, you'll be in good shape. No, 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 I'm not gonna sign the contract. I want it fixed now. We were able to negotiate a, uh, a, an extended six month period. They had some dude fly in from Germany do something up in the rail system and uh, it did fix the problem but the local service engineers couldn't fix the problem i didn't i didn't put that system under siemens it went under the multi vendor contract that we had so you know they thought they had it they had it made in shape but from a service excellence perspective dr tank that whole ir lab it was a, a common they used it for cath lab too sometimes they thought we walked on water because of what we did for them. Even though we weren't doing all the service with our own hands, we were documenting all the service. And it was a, a tremendous value. That CEO was sitting in there, Ron Seal, the COO was sitting in there. Uh, they all saw what we did for them. And that's the benefit of having a service excellence culture, documenting everything, making sure that your customer, because Siemens would have rolled right over them. Had clinical engineer had a good clinical engineering program not been in place, oh, you only had six problems. And the CEO and the CEO wouldn't know any difference, right? The, the clinicians could have said, oh no, but we had this, we had that, but nothing was documented. By us documenting, that made all the difference in the world. Siemens had no wiggle room. Yeah, they definitely know the right thing to do. You just got to empower them and get it done. So I think this is my last slide. So just a, a couple of bullet points about the service excellence. Service excellence, it's the culture. Create and feed the culture of service excellence. So again, put it in writing, create it, document it, um, feed it. So get that feedback mechanism, uh, the ability to go and round appropriately or send out an email from your CMS, hey, how did we do? And you know we're all bombarded with email, so you have to be careful uh, from that perspective. Sometimes it's it's better uh, to to go up and in person during a rounding. Even you as a leader, go up and round and uh, talk with the director. Or if you have huddle meetings on a daily basis, you know safety huddle meetings uh, in the hospital, uh, go up there and speak with uh, the leadership and, and just get the, the finger on the pulse of what's going on, go ahead Al. And make the surveys uh, short, short and sweet, because uh, you'll get a much better response rate uh, from that perspective. Make sure it's impactful, you know, it, it's giving you the data that you need to do. Because remember, I, I told you earlier in the uh, presentation, keep it on a feedback loop. Make sure, to your point about, you get the results, and then you put together an action plan, if there needs to be an action plan. Or the action plan is, Okay, how do we get to the next step, the exceptional level versus the excellent level? Level, you know. And Teresa, so sometimes it's out of our control. But if you let the communication, in fact, if you let them know, hey, the parts on back order, you know, we're doing everything in our power to source the part. Uh, you know, that Steris experience I had. You know, finally we found one in the trunk of some guy's car in, uh, you know, somewhere in Idaho or something like that. And uh, but. Even I thought, you know, did Steris have SAP or something? They they didn't know that the trunk stock of that guy's car had a, had a, the right part that I needed in it. Uh, that's a frustrating part. Um, but, Trace, to your point, the communication, the feedback loop back to the customer to let them know. And again, maybe the CMS, you know, but that's a little bit impersonal, right? Plus, they're getting a lot of email. So maybe that personal communication going up there and letting them. Yeah. That's 99.9% .9 of it. That's what I say about the PM. 99.9% you know, .9 of the PM is cleaning the device. I tell my team that all the time because the nurse or the physician, you could calibrate that all you want or check this and check that. None of that they see. But you know what? When you take that device off the floor and it looks horrible and you bring it back up and it's night shiny, you know, Sheila and her team on the asset management side 
that's that's a huge focus for them. It's just making sure it's clean, making sure it looks better. Lynn, you had a yep. It's the service excellence culture. It's the culture you're building. And you know, you got dare, dare I say, you gotta pass. You gotta pass because of the culture you've created. They know you're doing everything. It, it's not that you're not trying to fix the device. It's hey, there's circumstances way beyond our facility here that's causing us to be delayed in the service delivery program. So good story. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's it, it's how you communicate. You know, there was a, a presentation at Amy meeting a long time ago. You know, med, uh, biomed techs are from Venus and nurses are from Mars or something like that. And it was all about the communication. You know, and what do we do when we go upstairs and we're going to go pick up advice? Well, what's wrong with it? It's broke. Where if you would say, hey, what are the symptoms of this problem? Now the nurse, oh, well, let me tell you. It's it's this, it's that. It didn't do that when I turned it. That's that, that you, how you communicate makes a difference as well. So yeah, what, what are the symptoms? Not, hey, what's wrong with it? It's broke. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you know, to your point, we used we used Google surveys, uh, SurveyMonkey, you know, whatever you can put together, make it easy, make it quick, uh, you know, brief survey. Uh, I usually also let them, if they wanted to type in something, sometimes they mentioned uh, the technician. I like that part, and I, I put that in the uh, the survey. Hey, you know, somebody you feel. Uh, you want to mention somebody's name, feel free. Um, so it gets great feedback. Hire the right fit, the right team member. Sometimes, you know, we uh, we don't always have, uh, you know, I, I made a comment about an engineer looking at his shoes while he's communicating with somebody. You know, that's, that's part of the uh, issues. These days, you know, maybe we can't be too fussy with who we hire. But uh, make sure we hire the right fit people that uh, that builds that service excellence culture for you. Um, the removal of bureaucracy and barriers allows you to make quick decisions like Pat was talking about. Power the team. Uh, beware of previous team cultures of the HTM staff. So I, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. You know, where they came from. You know, I, I've been around the block in this 39 years that I've been here. And some of my peers, uh, you know, want to do it all, and they don't. Uh, they don't empower the team to make decisions. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's a disappointing situation when I walk into a facility, and the team feels that they always have to. Well, I have to ask permission for that, or I have to ask to do that, or I, you know, it's like, man, there's got to be some time that you have that authority to to deliver the right service, to do the right thing. Um, and then make sure you continue to reinforce. So when they do have great results, make sure you celebrate. I'd like uh, Lynn, the, the, uh, the SPD department threw a, a little a shindig for them. Uh, same thing for our department, you know, if they do it right, make sure you celebrate those successes. So, and I think, that's the last slide. So I know I wasn't Carol Davis Smith, but hopefully uh, you took away a few nuggets of information. It'll make your program better uh, from my presentation. From my presentation, and uh, you know I lo I love the uh, the survey information, the uh, you know CMMS. Go to your CMMS. See if they can uh, you know do some automatic emails or uh, surveys right from the e uh, CMMS system.